outside. Um, we have plenty of seats at the table, even more up here as, as other join us. Staff, I just ask if people come in late, please encourage everybody to make their way uh, onto the meeting table. So first off, um, again, good afternoon. My name is Bob Crum. I think I know uh, just about everybody in the room, but I'm the executive director here at the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission and the Hampton Roads Transportation Planning Organization. And I just want to take a second to once again welcome everyone for uh, being here at the regional building today for a conversation that is a staff we are incredibly excited about. Uh, before we go around the room and do some introductions, I, I just want to say a few quick uh, comments about what brings us here today and this um, joint meeting between the Regional Transit Advisory Panel and our uh, Regional Housing Assessment Working Group, which is a new group uh, that held its first meeting uh, just about a little over a month ago. So as a Regional Transit Advisory Panel, we haven't been together since about August, but uh, we're, we're going to be ramping back up for some more advocacy work that we're going to be talking about. Um, obviously, you've been a, a great committee uh, working together now for since the 2020 General Assembly session on uh, transit work and advocacy uh, in the Hampton Roads region. Uh, at our October meeting of the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission, Shernita Bethea, who you're going to hear uh, from shortly, and her colleague, Deja uh, Garrett, uh, provided our commission an overview presentation on housing uh, issues in the Hampton Roads region. And our commission took action to form a regional uh, housing assessment working group. And you'll hear from some of those members today as we go around the table and do some introductions. And, that housing uh, assessment working group held its first meeting. Uh, Shernita had, uh, had it, it, Brian was in attendance from Chesapeake. And of course we were down at Heron Landing here, a military circle, and we had a really productive first meeting. But it was at that meeting that our housing committee said, you know, we really need to connect in with the Regional Transit Advisory Panel. I think as we all know, there's a lot of synergies and connections between how we think about transit, how we think about housing, how we think about housing market, how we think about connections between housing and employment opportunity and how we move people in our regional community. So Ms. McClellan, I wanna thank you for bringing that up and saying, Bob, why don't, why don't we get a joint, joint meeting of the two groups together? And that's what brings us here today. Um, so before we, uh, before we get into the, the heart of uh, our agenda, what I'd like to do is, um, I, why don't we go around the table? It's great to see a full table here for this conversation, but why don't we just go around, uh, give our name and, and who we represent. So, uh, uh, Pavitra, can I start with you, please? Good afternoon. Pavitra Parthasarathy with the Hampton Roads TPO. Rob Case with the Hampton Roads TPO. Martha McLeese with Virginia Beach Vision. Quan McLaren with HRPDC in HRTPO. Deidre Garrett, Hampton Roads Planning District Commission. Chris Nykirk with the Atlantic Avenue Association. Good afternoon, Andrea McClellan, uh, Norfolk City Council, Norfolk PDC, Hampton Roads Transit, <laughs> and the uh, Hampton Roads uh, Affordable Housing uh, Workforce Group. I'm Mary Bunting. I'm from Hampton, and I also have the um, honor of serving as the chair of the Hampton Roads Chief Administrative Officers Group. Steve Brown, Hampton City Council member. Donnie Tuck, City of Hampton. Chris Taylor, Virginia Beach City Council. Angie Bezik, uh, Principal Advantage Government Relations Group, and I work with a number of the chambers and um, uh, local liaisons. Good afternoon, Janet V. Green, CEO of Habitat for Humanity Peninsula and Greater Williamsburg. Brian Thrower, Southampton County. Rick Dwyer, the Hampton Roads Military and Federal Facilities Alliance. Randy Keaton, Isle of Wight County. Sean Avery, Hampton Roads Workforce Council. Good afternoon, Sarah Jane Kirkland, Old Dominion University. Steve Jones, Naval Station, Norfolk. Brian Solis, City of Chesapeake. I'm in the Housing Working Group. 
Jim Wofford, MacArthur Center. Alexis Majid, Hampton Roads Transit. Ben Goodall with Waynesburg Area Transit. Good afternoon, Ray Amoruso, Hampton Roads Transit. Brian Smith, Hampton Roads Transit. Gary Harris, Center for Sustainable Communities. Boris Wade, Surrey County. Boris Shilano, HRTPO. Matthew Harrington, HRTPO. Carl Jackson, City of Portsmouth. Shannon Glover, Mayor, City of Portsmouth. Todd Nichols, Hampton Roads Military and Federal Facilities Alliance. Good afternoon, Greg Rote, Norris PDC. Keith Darrow, originally here for WHRO, uh, but now also here for the City of Norfolk as the City Transportation Engineer. And rounding it up, no. <laughs> <laughs> Shanita Bethay, um, Hampton Roads Planning District Commission Housing Administrator. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody, for uh, taking the time to do that. Um, I'm going to walk us through just a couple of formalities. We'll just take a couple of minutes, and then we're really going to let Shanita uh, lead us into the, the heart of our agenda today. Uh, the first item, I, you, you see our agenda items for today. Uh, one, we're going to talk about opportunities for coordination between our housing work and our public transit opportunities. That will be our first agenda item. And then I'll join Alexis and the HRT team as we talk about an opportunity for our second transit advocacy, advocacy event uh, that we'll be coordinating through the Regional Transit Advisory Panel. Does anybody have any objections to, to that agenda? Sound like a consensus to move forward. Uh, the second item, uh, just a formality, we'll do is this in two pieces. First, for the Regional Transit Advisory Panel, uh, RTAP members, you see the minutes from our previous meeting in the agenda. Um, could I just have a motion and a second and a concurrence for approval of those minutes as, as presented? Yes. Anybody care to make a motion on that? Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. Second, very good. Well, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll say that's by consensus. Uh, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? All right, thank you. And then more recently, um, our regional housing assessment working group meeting, uh, summary minutes from January 31. Hope everybody had a chance. Ms. McClellan, can I have a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. Um, any comments on that? All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Any opposed? Fantastic. And Pavitra, thank you. I jumped over public comment. Let me pause a second and I don't see any, but I'll just formally call for any public comments. Okay, seeing none, we're gonna move into our the meat of our agenda. Uh, item number five, opportunities for coordination. And we're gonna have a group, uh, Shernita is gonna be our lead person on this with Deidre and then Greg and I will be uh, We'll be commenting in as well. But Trinita, why don't I turn the floor over to you and um, let you kickstart this conversation for us today. And we thought we wanted this to be conversational, so we're going to do this from the table today rather than the podium. Absolutely. We wanted to, uh, we're, we're going to have a few slides, but we really wanted today to be listening to you, getting some great feedback and discussion. Uh, we've prepared a few slides, but we want to leave enough time on the end or in the middle, we want this to, if you want or have any questions or concerns, please jump in. Um, it's gonna be very important as we move toward uh, really looking at a regional housing model to make sure that we have the right input and the right feedback. Uh, back in the summer, uh, when Bob and I initially talked, this was one of the groups that we had initially talked about coming to letting you all know the programs and services that we are involved with. So RTAP has been on the radar, but when this particular initiative came, we know that we needed to share a little bit more information. Before we get into the regional housing discussion, uh, we wanna talk a little bit about some of the other overall programs uh, that we do have in-house here at the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission, talk about what the adequate housing work group is doing, and really have a rich conversation about your perspective as it relates to transit, as it relates to transportation needs. How do we couple that um, with housing? So really quick, and this is a, a real quick snapshot of some of the other programs and services that we do offer here at the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission. We are the regional administrator of home funds for down payment and closing costs. That provides first time home 
homeowners with the down payment and closing costs associated with buying a home, the opportunity to become first time home buyers. Generally, we were working under DHCD with their regional home fund program. Um, in later years, we are also administering funds for Chesapeake, Isle of Wight County, Smithfield, and Portsmouth as direct, uh, as direct administrators. And this allows your, your fire responders, your nurses, your educators, your workers at Walmart to be able to realize the, the programs, uh, to realize home ownership. And we'll talk a little bit about home ownership. We also are the administrator of a program called SPARK through Virginia Housing, which is a interest rate reduction. As you all know from um, the news, you've seen the interest rates increase. This program allows us to buy interest rates down for uh, the BIPOC community. Uh, what we have seen is that interest rate increases in our area were really not allowing our buyers to purchase. So for instance, if the current interest rate is 5%, we're able to reduce that rate down to 4%. We're also the project lead for another new initiative through Virginia Housing and the Virginia Association of Planning District Commission um, called an affordable housing initiative. And we just met this morning at 11 o'clock. And this gave us $3 million to inject into projects and programs that were already on the ground. What we saw in COVID that we saw a huge increase in construction and development costs. And we had a lot of programs and a lot of projects that were on halt and unable to go forward without a little bit more money. So we were able to identify nine to 10 projects through your localities, either your housing authority or your housing departments internally to see if there was enough funding that we could do in order to get those projects off. And I see Janet Green, we're working with her in Jay City County on a project, uh, just allowing us to move these projects. These are affordable rental projects as well as home ownership. We also staff support several other groups and organizations working with Senior Services of Southeast Virginia. And we also have the Hampton Rose Housing Consortium which is a conglomerate of other nonprofits, for-profit organizations, and government institutions that get together on a quarterly basis for affordable housing. I know that's in a nutshell. We, we, we do a lot of other programs. Uh, we have business cards because what we have seen in order to get the word out about our programs, especially for first-time home buyers, we need you to share that information with your employers to get the word out. As you know all the time, if you turn on the news, you see subprime lenders are really able to get in front of clients, but how do we get the word out about the other programs that are out here in the community? So that's in a nutshell. Tomorrow night, we're also doing a consumer project and we have information that we can supply that we're talking to actual consumers in the entire region on home ownership, on projects that they can be um, attached to with Virginia Housing and to help them get the much needed information um, for them. So that's in a nutshell of what uh, the PDC is working on in a conjunction with the regional housing discussion. We want to talk to you about how we got here. So Deidre Garrett is going to share with you a little bit of information on some of the background of how we got to the adequate housing work group. Deidre. Thank you. So uh, back in August, we had a really great conversation with our community advisory uh, committee. Um, we had this conversation regarding housing. Uh, and there were so many differences of opinions around the table. Um, and we had a, a, a person come up and, and just say, well, you know, if everyone got their education and got a degree and became an engineer, then they could afford housing. And so I just kept listening, I kept listening, and I waited for everyone to get finished. And for me, listening to everyone, I said, well, when we talk about affordable housing or adequate housing for all, we want those people who have gotten their engineering degree and can afford $2,800 a month to be able to live in the same neighborhood as someone who cannot. She talked about Wallops Island and, and being an engineer at Wallops Island. Yeah, it's great for that engineer to be able to afford it, but what about the janitor that also works at Wallops Island, right? And so that's where this quote from. So I know you all have your phones and I'd like you to take your phones out and there's a QR code on your screen and also around the tables. Please go to menti.com and use that code. Thank you. 
All right, so we're seeing safety, stability, affordability, warmth, security, investment, achievement, family, love it, safe place. Okay. All right, and we have one more. We're going to go to the next. All right, and please let us know what the most pressing issue in housing you think. Oh. The, what's the most pressing issue in housing? All right, there we go. So supply, affordability, affordable housing options, affordable, affordable, affordable. Lack of avail availability of quality rents in the rural areas and cost. Perfect. So those issues also came up in all of our meetings. Uh, we comprised a list of the pressing issues that we're finding uh, as we continue to have these meetings with our housing partners and each and every one of you. Um, and of course, transportation stands out. And so this is why we decided to have this joint meeting. So in the rental area, affordability, evictions, housing choice vouchers, your short-term housing, your existing homes, aging housing, home ownership, the stock and location, poverty, of course, mobility and crime reduction, your special populations, our, our, our seniors are aging in place, uh, homelessness, transitional housing, shelter housing and permanent supportive housing. Uh, so Shanita is going to talk about those regional and sub-regional issues. So before we, 
before we move on to um, the next one, were there any areas that you feel was not represented here or any other um, segments that you feel that should be addressed in terms of most pressing in housing? Um, I think I think it's evident when we look at the maps that you have over there that we have concentrated areas of affordable housing, which may not be healthy for particular communities that have a lot of it and not very much of it in other places um, that need it. And one of the things we hear, for instance, is that people can't get a home near where they work. So you think about, for instance, and I'm just using this example not to pick on any cities, but the tourism industry doesn't pay high wages, and yet you don't necessarily see affordable housing in the communities that really host the majority of the tourism. And so there's a mismatch of available affordable housing throughout the entirety of the region. And in some cases, too much in some localities for it to be healthy for their tax base. And we listed it under deconcentration of poverty for that reason. Um, but it really just really speaks to how we move um, residents to op areas of opportunity and making sure that your, your communities are, are rich and diverse. Let's say for, for our locality of Surrey, um, access to clean water. In so the sure. environmental aspects of, of housing would be um, with clean water and environment. What about transportation? I mean, there's housing, there's affordable housing in a lot of areas, but the ability to get to them and get back to your place of employment is, a, is an issue. Absolutely, and that's why we're here, so that I can I can update this. And I had beautiful six tiles, so we need a seventh tile for transportation. So absolutely, um, exactly. The path I was going is that um, transit is affordable housing, transit is tourism, transit is workforce development. It, it is the connector for all of those things. And so a robust system of transportation, um, you know, it aids all of those things. And I've been asking just a little bit up at the General Assembly planting seeds. I like to plant seeds. Um, <laughs> And so one of the things I've been asking our legislators is, do you think that a robust transit system or transportation system would mitigate a lot of other issues? If you invested in the transit, would that alleviate the need for as many people to be on SNAP or you know they could get somewhere if you, if you were able to, to get people where they needed to be, would that mitigate other costs that local governments and state governments are paying for right now? It's a shift, but then you have the productivity in a way that you haven't had it before. And so, Greg, you should probably do a study on that. <laughs> <laughs> How about uh, uh, de development-induced displacement? That's where you have a big box store or something big box thing uh, located within 1,500 feet of a low income community and such. So that raises property taxes, that decreases mo mobility, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So development and induced, induced displacement is real. It should be part of our discussion. Mayor Glover. Yeah. Um, I did have a, a question that I wanted to bring up. I know um, City Manager Bunting had mentioned, you know, having affordable housing, but at the same time balancing and having enough folks, you know, within those affordable housing units to be able to meet the tax base standards, having that balance. I think I read in the newspaper or somewhere that one of the mayors in one of our cities in Virginia made a statement at his council meeting or a meeting he was having with, with some, some affordable housing folks that he didn't want any more Section 8 housing is in his community. And I raised the question because when we start talking about affordable housing in our localities, we need to be real honest with ourselves. What does that look like? And I'll give you an example because we were, we were in negotiations with a group that was bringing in affordable housing and we had some citizens come forward who said, we don't want 
Section 8 housing. We don't want uh, workforce housing. And, and we need all of those kinds of levels of housing in our community. So I just asked the question, are, are we, when we talk about affordable housing, uh, what does that look like for us? And, and are we gonna be realistic about that conversation? Uh, who that's going to bring into the community? Thank you. So I love that comment and I, I love that comment because uh, doing the work that she did and I do, we realized very quickly that affordable housing does not look like what people think affordable housing looks like. I could tell you that I serve a family of five all the way to a single person, uh, an elderly person, a disabled person, uh, someone who works a nine to five at Walmart, someone who um, is a bus driver. So I think our job is to dispel the myth in our area and in our region, that affordable housing is not the stigma that people think it is. So thank you. I, I know the reason a lot of us are here is transit, but I'd be remiss to not mention walkability as far as being able to access, you know, affordable housing close to the business centers. Um, I think it's important that we also discuss the quality of said housing as well. Uh, just because it's affordable doesn't mean that it shouldn't still be up to standard. Uh, and oftentimes what you'll see is that <clears throat> communities that are geared toward low to moderate income people and populations um, are subpar uh, and maybe not meeting the um, meeting the, the quality of life standards that they should be. Um, and just because someone may be near the poverty line does not mean uh, that they should live less than. So we're going to talk more about those because this is where we're really going to need your assistance and your help on how do we find out all of these questions? How do we find out the best practices? How do we know what we don't know um, in terms of housing? I know that we have a lot of experts in our own field and we're gonna talk about that. But I wanted to bring to your attention, even as a region, um, what we go through as it relates to housing issues, a little bit different um, depending on where you are in the state of Virginia and the nation. So for our area, uh, we are seeing an uptick of evictions and foreclosures after the COVID-19 pandemic. We had uh, quite a few different moratoriums in place to uh, help with evictions and foreclosures, those are all been lifted at this point. So you're going to see an uptick in some of our areas in, as it relates to evictions and foreclosures. Let me be clear, we had an issue with evictions and foreclosures prior to COVID-19, so that this pandemic only exacerbated what we were already seeing on the ground. As it relates to rental conditions, we're always looking at affordability issues. And when, as we're talking about who this person is, and it's come up a couple of times, we're hearing now again from um, a mother of a recent Radford University student, please get my son out of my basement. Um, we, all, we, we all see that. Uh, we also hear from um, middle-aged parents that are now um, helping and assisting their their parents with aging and how do they bring them in a home and have a home that's accessible. Uh, we have seniors that are wanting to downsize from a four and five bedroom home, but can't afford to give up that house and find something more affordable on one level because of the conditions of affordability. So again, the eye and the look of affordability looks different. We're also seeing instances of fair housing as it relates to source of income. Source of income was added as a protected class in the state of Virginia, but we're still seeing discrimination based on disability, based on the type of uh, assistance or the type of income a, a tenant may have. And we're also seeing people that have housing choice vouchers, but are able to find um, either a landlord to take them or anything that's affordable um, within the fair market rent of those areas. Of course, we've seen rising home values. It's great as a homeowner when you see your value go up, but just think about if you're a first time home buyer you're trying to get in um, to this, can you get in, can you actually afford it? We've heard from um, a lot of our installations as it relates to housing for the military, even though they receive an allotment for housing, they are now unable 
to find housing based on their allotment. Um, my niece is a dentist, and I, I tell the story now. She's at Fort Eustis, but she's driving from Suffolk each day to Fort Eustis for affordability. So we have to kind of look at that um, as it relates to transit. So that's another car on the highway um, in congestion to get to work, that if it was something closer, she may not have to make that commute. Um, homelessness continues to be um, an issue in our jurisdiction. We see it sometimes as urban, but we don't really talk about the rural impact of homelessness because it looks different. So that is something that we see throughout our region. Crime and violence, as Bob uh, is working through the task force of looking at that, housing and neighborhoods also become to the top of what we look at. And legislative priorities. We're just wrapping up General Assembly. We had a lot of bills from the, from the, from the perspective of housing that were shot down, of course, but we're still moving toward ensuring that we have a housing trust fund and some other ad, um, allocated money for that. So we're here to talk about what we what we consider the intersection of housing. And I think we have heard it. Uh, if you, in fact, fix transit, would the other issues kind of um, be eradicated? We don't know, but we do know that all of these issues kind of intersect what we see. So we call this the intersection of housing, how it relates to health. And you see, I put transit big because that's what we're here in terms of transportation. In terms of culture, looking at economic development, when big corporations are looking to move into our area and they look at our housing needs and they look at our housing structure and transit, are we being competitive to get the Amazons and to get some of these larger corporations to want to move their headquarters here? Employment. It's kind of chicken and egg, right? We want to give the person the job so they can afford the housing, but we also need to house them in a situation close so they can get to their employment. Poverty, wealth becomes a huge issue as it intersects with housing. We look at the social determinants of health. Um, we know that sometimes our low income areas are not the healthiest. We look at lead, we look at other indications of, of adequate housing as it relates to the quality of housing. Education, it's also a hot topic. How do we educate the workforce to get the jobs and how do we position people for that key? And looking at safety and well-being, I, I saw it up on the board. If you were to ask me what my one word was in terms of housing, in most days it's safety. It's where I feel safe. It's where I want to go at the end of the day, especially during COVID. It was where my my you know my family was, and it's safety for a lot of people. And just imagine if you were having to shelter in place in a neighborhood and in an area that wasn't already safe. So those are some of the intersections that we see um, as it relates to housing. So if we fix one, how do we fix the others? And for so many times, we have worked in our own sectors. We have worked in housing, we have worked in transportation, and never the two shall ever met in the middle to talk about these initial issues. But we see that right now that this, this community and this conversation, we have to kind of um, step aside and really start doing some planning without the silos. So if anything happens with, uh, with this is to break these silos that we have worked in for so many years, uh, because we know that we need everyone around the table. I kind of listed some of the key Excuse players. Me. Excuse me, Madam yeah. Chair. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I want us to consider too, when you talk about affordable housing, we talk about getting a job where you can afford to live in your home. But there's another side of this too, uh, in terms of living in your home and then being able to enjoy the, the amenities in your community. Uh, that's, um, it could be entertainment, going to a restaurant, uh, sporting events, uh, you know, those types of things that will, if you don't budget for, uh, you would have someone who lives in a house, they pay their mortgage, but they struggle with staying there because they can't afford the amenities in that community. So I think we have to look at uh, certainly higher wages uh, because you could have working poor living in a house that they consider affordable, but yet they can't have a holistic family balance where well, others around them are going to events and doing things and enjoying their families, uh, they're confined to struggling to make that payment uh, to stay there another 30 days. So and that's what we're seeing is that if they are able to afford the payment, 
In most cases, they're unable to afford the utilities. Um, food is the number one thing that starts being um, cut back and also medication. So that's why when you look at in terms of all of those areas, they're all tied in. So you're in this wonderful community, but you can't even afford, like you said, to go and take up a baseball game because all of your resources are put strictly on maintaining your housing costs. And Madam Chair, let me make one more comment too. And the caution here is if, if you're in that situation, it's most likely you may be in a situation where you may be in foreclosure at some point. So to avoid that, you know, we certainly have to look at uh, folks are getting jobs, but workforce is so important. Uh, they, they're getting a living wage to be able to take care of the utilities and other things that come along with home ownership. Um, thank you. And to, um, to his point, we, um, we own a small business in Virginia Beach and we're losing employees um, to other cities because we were low wage, 12 to $13 an hour. So in the last 30 days, we've lost about five or six employees because they're having to share apartments. Um, it's not safe. They're sleeping on couches. And so they've decided to move from Virginia Beach. All they, they really love working for our small business, but they can go to Williamsburg, Hampton, Newport News, some other cities and get more for their money. And we're primarily hiring 20 to say 26 year olds and they want to be able to pay their rent but also, you know, go to a movie. And um, some of them, these young ladies, they don't want to sleep on the couch with three other people. And so that brings in the safety component. And these are college educated um, or in college, and they, they just leave because they have to, they want a better quality of life. So when we look at, um, uh -oh, real quick can address this. I remember when I first came to Hampton Roads as a young sailor and um, certainly uh, my wife and I needed a place to stay. We wanted a home. And when we looked at our, uh, our options, uh, we, we were able to find something we could afford. And at that time, I remember they would base your income, maybe 30% of your income could go toward housing, right? So today I hear it's about 50% of your income that is, is going toward housing when, when you go to sit down with someone and look at it. And that's a huge issue. I know that certainly prices have gone up, but when you think about it, it used to be a third of your income that, that you couldn't contribute any more than that to your housing. Now it's 50% of more that people are contributing to their housing needs. I think it's, it's, it's a bigger problem. The federal government, the state government, you know, and an example, when we were trying to recruit new police officers in the city of Portsmouth, one of the things we talked about was giving those new officers perhaps a housing incentive, right? Because if we want, we want first responders and people to stay in our community, normally when they get hired, they may not make a big salary. So we need to come up with creative and innovative ways to cut the gap because we know that our wages are not climbing as fast is all those other things. And, and we can talk more about that. There are a couple of localities moving that way. And, and that's going to be what we're the ask is in terms of how do we kind of get some of these best practices in place. Um, and when you speak on 30% of your income, I just want to be clear that that is your gross income. Correct. And we, we tell our clients all the time, not your net, not what's, you know, what you're bringing home, but those calculations are based on your gross income. So if you're going up to 50%, that's money that you technically don't have in your hand um, as it relates to that. Uh, so unfortunately, but fortunately, these are the key players as it relates to housing, as it relates to regulatory um, laws that we have to abide by in terms of the funding that's out here. This is kind of a footprint as to all the key players as it relates to housing. Now, in terms of transportation, we have seen over the last couple of years that there have been some joint grants and some joint initiatives through some of these organizations, as well as EPA, uh, Federal Highway as well, that are looking at the, the correlation between housing and transit. But I just wanted to kind of break down uh, a lot of times you see on social media when you see a, a grant or a program and they say, well, why can't we build 
tiny houses or why can't we do this? Most of your regulatory bodies and from the federal aspect pretty much earmark those funds for specific reasons. Janet's nodding. She knows when you're looking at development and you're looking at housing, if it's a CDBG grant, you can only do these things. If it's a home grant, you can only utilize that for that reason. So in terms of housing in the snapshot, your housing providers have to kind of weave in and out of making sure from a regulatory standpoint that those grants are in line. But for the most part, most of the grants that you see does not give you 100% coverage as it relates to building these projects. As it relates to local, I really wanted to spend some time on the local impact of housing. When you're looking at local government, as we're working with putting, toward, uh, putting together projects, going between zoning, your codes, your planning office, your housing authority, all of those key players have to be around the table on the same sheet of music. Your housing authorities are in play and your civic leagues and your neighborhood associations are there. But what we have talked about, and Deidre alluded to that, is the public and political will. A lot of times as elected officials, you know what the right thing to do, but there's a lot of pushback. And what we call it, Mayor Glover, is not in my backyard, it's NIMBYism. They think it's a great opportunity to build affordable housing, but they don't want it in their communities. Um, so we're, we're running across doing the right thing but we're understanding from a public perspective and from a political perspective that set sometimes rules or it, it works with our engagement as it relates to that. So that's something that we need to be mindful. And it kind of goes back to how do we, how do we develop that message um, that we're doing the right thing and having adequate housing for all for that pr perspective. Can, can I ask a question? Cause go back, if you can go back to that other slide. Um, I just would like some clarification on, because um, I'm not the I'm not the brightest bulb in the chandelier by any stretch of imagination. Uh, and but in looking at regional, there you've got trade associations. Can you give me a little bit more amplification on what, where, what does trade associations do with regards to key players? In that? Well, R1. so a lot of your trade organizations, like your builders associations and things of that nature, they are working with the developers. They are working with um, pretty much Greg has always said this is that most of the time your developers and those buildings know where the where the market is going to shift before we even know. So they're really dictating um, where the housing is going, if it's market rate, if it's affordable and what localities they can build. And our trade organizations have a huge lobbying force. They're heavily um, at the General Assembly. They're heavily with federal um, with federal uh, delegations to push and to make sure that they have what they need in order to be out there. So we wanted to list them because we know that they need to be around the table as well because we need to kind of hear from them what they're seeing as it relates to the market. Right. So you're so when you talk trade associations, you're basically talking to those around the development type trade associations um, that represent that. That could be a part of it. Um, so we I mean, have. Like I, you know, I represent ship repairs. Right. So this is housing. That's why I'm asking how do I. Perfect. Yeah. So so this was a snapshot of housing. So when you talk about the ship builders perspective, when we look at a collective uh, a plan, you need to be there as well. So we're talking about how do we house the people that work for you? How do you get them close so they're not stuck in traffic and unable to report on time? So as we build, I called it at our last meeting, the old oak tree. I'm country and from Southwest Virginia. But if you cut a tree, you see all the rings of how long. I see this as starting with the core and then expanding out that we have all of these key players. Housing people sometimes don't know what your needs are and vice versa. So your name will be Sharpie under trade associations name. So you're, you're a key player in housing. I knew I should have kept my mouth shut. <laughs> no. Shernita, I think we have a chair of our working committee. <laughs> All those in favor? We just need to negotiate salary. <laughs> it's the ministry of it. We all work for free. Um, with regard to your comments about political pressures, NIMBYism, um, I agree that's that's a huge deal on so many um, topics of the, of the day. Um, I think part of that answer is much broader than these meetings um, going into the neighborhood. I think it starts in school, civic credits, um, 
uh, junior high, high school, even before that learning at an earlier age about all of that, in, well into the colleges, they should you know, get some sort of credits because these are the people who will become the influencers and the policy makers. And if we invest in that now, if we plant the seed, then it grows. And they influence their parents. They're directing where they go on vacations now when they're seven years old, for goodness sake. I mean, <laughs> if, they, if they start talking about this and, and you know, offering solutions and being engaged in a, at school about it, then they can be um, the influencer in their own household. Yeah, quickly here. Uh, back back on that slide, I, I, you know, I was straining. I, I, I couldn't see, maybe, maybe I'm getting old or something, but I, I don't see uh, the housing industry itself, you know, and how we're holding them accountable, how they're culpable. You know, and how the, the multi-layered structure of that industry uh, 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 forces prices and such. When, when we talk about market rate and such, you know, what does that mean? You know, given, given the, the, the vastness of this housing industry and how it operates and such. And, and you got this, you got grandma over here trying to hold on to her house and she's fighting against this huge well-oiled machine and such, with no hope whatsoever. Like, so how do we hold these folks down? So, can I, so uh, when you say housing folks or people, what what is your your definition of that? I'm, I'm looking at everyone from the from from the frontline real estate person, okay, through the the builder, through the the banker, you know, through the supplier. That 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 entire uh, life cycle, that, 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 that entire su supply chain and okay. such, which, which, which results in a home and the home's price. Can I, uh, can, I, can I weigh in on this one? Sure. I, I think that's, that's where you get to local government and state government and federal government. We, as the electeds, are setting the zoning policy. We, as the electeds, have the authority, sometimes we do, if it's a Dillon roll, maybe we don't, but we have the authority locally to create inclusionary housing policy. So we can't just say it'd be nice to have it. We have to put it in code because as, as a business, a developer needs to have certainty when they get into a project. And, that, and so we, that's where we evolve. I don't think that we can do it at a regional level, but certainly at a state and a local level, and to some extent federal policy can also. Is that, is that correct, Bob? Or, are, you, no, are, you, I, are you saving I, me here? No, yeah, okay, I, yeah, I think you're doing great. You're doing great. <laughs> Mayor Tuck, I think you were looking for a minute. Thank you. And, and I was thinking about a number of things, and some have already been said. Um, you talked about marketing, or doing a better job of marketing. And I think one of the, our challenges when we talk about affordable housing, I think someone else mentioned it, not everyone understands the concept. I think minds immediately go to Section 8 poor. Around this table, we generally talk about police, uh, fire, educators, uh, maybe people just starting out in their first job. We don't look at that aspect of it. So I think we've got to try and figure out what it is we're talking about, and maybe that becomes our marketing tool. Um, I think in another setting, I talked about, uh, and every now and then I, I, I look at Reason Magazine, and it talks about how we can um, maybe build more housing and which some of it could be more affordable. But the challenges are their national building code which says that I think for every unit, you've got to have maybe one and a half parking spaces or two parking spaces or whatever. And yet we are being told that this new generation, young people, all they care about really is just having a place to sleep or whatever, and they're going to be out and about, and you know, now you can work from home and work remotely and whatever. And yet now we still focus on having these single family homes um, or maybe townhomes. And so I, I think because of the International Building Code and so many, I guess, localities swear by it, maybe even states, governments, that we, we are maybe bound. And I know you talked about what we can do locally, but I think many of us are bound because we still have to have that one and a half or two spaces per apartment unit. And we don't think about mass transit being an option or even walkability. The other thing, and I started looking at it back in the 1990s, and I think a reality 
I think we've got to determine what group we're talking about. And I've heard we talk about seniors and we talk about others. But I think we've got to understand that there is a segment of our population, I'm not sure what that percentage is, that will always have difficulty with respect to having the incomes, and they could be young folks, they could be seniors, to have affordability, okay? 12 to $13 an hour. Um, my daughter was living with us up until maybe four years ago, um, and I thought she had a great job, uh, which was paying a living wage. But her apartment choices, when we say you got to move out, weren't great. You know, maybe $900 a month. And she didn't have a whole bunch of other expenses, but she still hasn't been able to manage her money. And she's in her 30s. Another side story. But if you think about, um, and this goes back to some bad history, but if you think about segregation, discrimination, an opportunity that some individuals had, they weren't able to get the jobs that paid above a living wage. And I can go back and look at my own family situation that um, the 60s, my mother was domestic, my father cooked a fraternity house nine months a year, other three months we got by mowing lawns, washing windows, doing floors, whatever. And the house we lived in was a four room house. Um, Steve may know, had uh, no underpinning. So it was set up about three feet in the back. Um, when it got below 32 degrees, our water pipes froze. And all he had was cold water anyway. And my father go to his job and bring water back to us. But I'm thinking about that house and we paid $10 a week for it. Went across town, put $10 on a planter. Now we've come a long, long way. But if I still think about my parents, had we not been able to build our own house in the mid 60s, how would they have had any kind of, I guess, social security or whatever it is, retirement to live off of? So I think that's a challenge for people who have been in low income jobs is that now they are into their 50s or 60s. And yeah, you look at 30% of your income, but you add in inflation and you take what they may have been able to save if they saved anything, they're going to struggle. So you've got a population of folks, you pick the range and they're going to struggle. And yet at this table, I'm not even sure which population we're talking about. Um, but everyone's going to struggle, and I think we've got to do a better job of marketing. Who we're talking about? We're we talking about seniors. I think everybody's heart goes out to seniors. Uh, if we're talking about police and fire and educators and the ability for them to live in our communities where we hire them, I think our hearts go out to them. But I think we're also going to be faced with the challenge of there will be populations in our cities that need affordable housing, and we're going to be challenged to provide it for them. We can all go home now. <laughs> um, and, and what you speak on is, is pretty much the term that we're using is adequate housing. And when we, we talk about marketing, and we talk about a part of what we're looking at as it relates to this housing assessment that we want to move to, is first of all, how many clients are we missing that there are already services and programs out there that could assist you, assist them. Uh, Deidre and I all day are looking for clients as it relates to first time home buyers, down payment and closing costs and linking them. So how do we link the services and programs that are already out here existingly for clients that it will free up the ability for us to work with the most vulnerable of the populations? Because we know um, when you're looking at someone who's worked, like you said, their entire life, did the right thing. That's what they said based on their education, based on their segregation, everything else that they had. How do we give them a quality of life? There's nothing sadder than to work your entire life for those golden years and you're still struggling. That's sad. You know, we're telling our children, go out, retire, do the right thing, and you have golden years. And we see so many of our seniors still struggling, if not more. Um, so we want to look at those and, and we're going to definitely need your input on what this study and gap analysis will look at, what would be the target areas. We know we can't bite off the entire spectrum in, at one time. It's just too overwhelming. But how do we get a good start that at least the impactful, intentional work that we do around this table uh, can give us enough uh, increase 
that we can kind of go back and kind of help one of those vulnerable populations. So I'm going to kick it to Greg to talk a little bit about the placement of housing, how do we get where we are um, as it relates to housing, and um, just talk a little bit about what the regional perspective is of where we are now. Thanks, Shernita. So if you just for a second think back to the decisions you made to get into the house you're in now, wherever you're living, house, apartment, condo, think back for a second the discussions you had with your significant other, your household, your kids. Quite a conversation, right? It's not a quick one. You don't get to pick a place. And now multiply that by 800,000 households in Hampton Roads. So everybody's coming at this from a different perspective. So some of the key factors are, you know, you're getting starter home, single family home, condo, multifamily. For some people, right, they're looking just for shelter. But everybody starts in a place. Um, what is it that we're looking for? And then, of course, how much can you afford? Right? That lays on top of it pretty quick. Uh, there's factors that you put into this. Um, is it near work? You know, one person lives far away from one, and you know, my wife works here and I work there, so where do we go in the middle? Uh, are we near transit? Um, is it near the lifestyle they want? But you know, some of the basic stuff too. Is it safe? Do I feel safe when I come home? Am I around crime? Um, and then. Those who have kids, schools, one of the number one factors. Right? You can essentially think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs if you want to go back to school and think about that. Right? You have these fundamental things that build up to, to choosing the house you want, and not everybody's starting from the same base. So all these factors in making housing choices, and underneath each one is a layer of decisions that you have to make and then opportunities or lack of opportunities that are so one of the things we have for you, and I hope if you haven't before, uh, if you get the chance, just go and take a look at some of the maps Sarah Kidd put together for us here. Um, I think that, you know, there's a reason we're here today, and it's not to solve housing. What you've heard from Deidre and Shernita, at least I hope you've heard, is housing is incredibly complex. There is no one single top housing issue. There isn't one. There's hundreds of issues that come up and they revolve, they change. And then if you look at all these issues and all these players, there's programs out there that, all, that cover the whole region that go beyond the region. And then we have all these localities and all these neighborhoods and regional organizations. I hope you're beginning to understand the complexity of housing. So when you say, how do we solve the region's housing issues? Well, uh, you don't eat the elephant all at once, right? It's one bite at a time. But I want to stress that this, this is incredibly complex. And when we talk about the intersections of housing, which Shernita brought forward, the intersection of housing, where it lays on with quality of life and the economy, what we're here for is we want to see where the intersections are with transportation and transit. We can't fix all the housing issues, but what we're trying to do is gain an understanding of what strings can we pull, what levers can we pull to address certain issues that are pressing and get a better understanding of the whole landscape Hampton Road. So if you can, after you take a look at some of these maps, I think you'll probably start looking at this and go, well, this doesn't make sense. And how do this tie together? I mean, if you look at the housing cost burden for renters versus homeowners, I mean, I've seen this data a bunch of times and Sarah puts that on a map and I'm still like, wow, that is really stark, right? So start taking a look at these things and, and get a better understanding. But I don't want you to think that you know, we can sick, fix this, this issue. I really hope you get an understanding of just how complex it is. And then let's try tie it into transit and transportation. Bob, can I ask a quick question? Absolutely. I'm just curious, I was, of the Virginia Beach example, for example, these young ladies, would they have considered staying if they had been close to transit? Do they know what transit? Have they ever ridden transit? I mean, a lot of this is, when you talk to the realtors, are they talking about transit? When you talk to the multifamily folks, are they saying the bus stops are here and here's where you can go? There's no, there's no crossover. This is anecdotal because I'm looking at Ray. I don't think we have that crossover. I don't think there's an education as to where the transit is relative to a 
affordable housing and how people can get easily, particularly with the new 757 Express and 15 minute you know, rides, that maybe it would open up a world of affordable housing that people just didn't know about. So I guess that's why we're here, by the way. So that really just segues us, uh, and Ray, Ray we're, we're making Ray smile now because <laughs> but it really it really gets us into the space that we want to drill into today. I want to thank Shernita and DJ and Greg for setting the table for this conversation. And as Greg mentioned and as Shernita described, this is a very comprehensive uh, challenge that we have. That we do have an opportunity now. We are at a moment in time that for the first time, in our region, we have a dedicated funding source to help HRT build this regional backbone network. Uh, Greg mentioned the maps that we have up there. Right in the center is their proposed 13 uh, route backbone system, the 757 Express. And Ray's gonna talk to you about uh, 15 minute intervals along those backbone routes. And he's gonna talk with you about uh, bus stops and amenities to really make a system that is interconnected in this region that we can be proud of. So the opportunity um, that the RTAP has mentioned is now how do we how do we think about opportunities? Uh, in particular, if you remember, you identified eight to nine topic areas that we could connect to the transit conversation. One of them was housing. One of them was affordable housing. And I just I just want to recap some of the things that you all brought forward, the housing work group. Right, you talked about uh, exploring opportunities for workforce housing near the regional backbone routes. Is there an opportunity for density now around these regional backbone routes? And do we have the opportunity to move people efficiently in a way that we haven't to before? How do we connect land use planning with those backbone routes? You, you had talked about assembling a team of stakeholders like urban planners and human service organizations and realtors to develop resources that we can use uh, to encourage affordable housing, looking at things like inclusionary zoning, incentive-based approaches, density and transit-oriented development around these backbone routes. Um, you talked about uh, education. Um, you talked about again today about transit, transit access, access to affordable housing and how it relates to a living wage. And, and, and again, other groups even had cross connects, the group that talked about transit oriented development. You talked about many of the same things and how we could capitalize and start to make the connection between housing choice and when our trans, where our transit routes are located. Um, you know, as we look around the region, our region is considering some really important decisions about where future employment centers may be. And some of those centers could be significant. This could be the opportunity to commit to that connection between employment, between public transit service, and between some of our um, opportunities uh, related to transit. So what I asked Ray to do is to give us a brief overview of where HRT is with the rollout of the 757 Express and, and Ray, um, opportunities that I know you've been HRT has been talking about for a while, but you know now we seem to be in a moment in time to really be able to pivot in, into this space. So Ray, why don't, why don't I turn it over to you, sir? Thank you, Bob, and thanks for that opportunity. Um, Andrea, uh, what a nice tag team. Um, you know, uh, kudos to you for bringing up that point. Now, I consider myself native now to this region. I moved here in 2000, actually was serving the client at the time since 1997. But I am a native New Yorker from New York City. And let me tell you, the first question anybody asked when they were looking for an apartment or housing was, how close is it to the subway stop? How close is it to the bus line? Does it have express bus service? You were considered a lunatic to want to own a car and drive to Manhattan every day. And you were considered really, really special if you wanted to live in Staten Island, which had no transit service. Manhattan, or Brooklyn, or Queens. So it really strikes me that this region that dialogue never occurs when the realtors are shepherding people around looking at opportunities of where one wants to live. It's never, never in the conversation. So let's start with that as, as something to enter. And I um, just wanted to make that reflection. Um, let's, let's go to the first slide here. I put the wrong date up, I'm sorry. I must be in an alternative universe. 
Um, no, we'll, we'll start with the pictures. Um, just a little bit of background about HRT. Probably everyone here knows about it, but maybe some don't. Hopefully I'll hit the right key. Um, today we have 69 routes that serve six cities. Some of them are local bus routes that provide coverage and what we call essential lifeline services to communities. Some of them operate in primary arterials and major corridors if you think of military highway, battlefield, river park, rainbow parkway in the city. Um, some of them are express commuter services that have specific characteristics that are going to major employment centers like Huntington Ingalls or Newport News or Naval Station in Norfolk or even an Amazon facility out in Suffolk. So we have a variety of different routes that do different things for different people. We operate multiple modes as, as arrayed um, on this picture between bus and ferry connecting downtown Portsmouth to downtown Norfolk. The Virginia Beach Wave seasonal service is very special as it addresses the influx of people that come into this region between mid-May and the end of September to uh, the primary economic engine of the city of Virginia Beach and serve the tourists that come out here and hopefully give an impression that We've got it together here in terms of mobility options. And of course, we have a starter line of light rail that uh, runs for seven and a half miles uh, from one medical complex practically to another medical complex, 11 stations at a time. We also offer paratransit services to uh, those that don't have the opportunity to drive a single occupant vehicle or use standard transit. Um, it's a certification process for those that are eligible to use it. However, it's a requirement um, when any transit property takes federal funding. Let's think about a minute, and it's been touched upon already. We all take for granted that we, we have the, the freedom to jump in our single occupant vehicle because we're either able-bodied, we're financially secure and have the ability to own an automobile. But a lot of people in this region don't have as many choices as we do when it comes to mobility. We have the transit-reliant users that have very basic mobility needs just like we all do. We want to go to work, we want to go to school, shopping, maybe a medical appointment. Well, think about that if you don't have a car. You know, if you're running late for your doctor's appointment, you know how hard they're to get, they're, they are to get nowadays. You know, you can go that extra 15 miles an hour, maybe risk running a yellow to red light to get there on time. What does it mean for someone when they're using transit that runs in an hourly headway? that for whatever reason perhaps left the garage a little bit late and caused you to miss that one hour service, you waited six months for that doctor's appointment and now you have to wait another hour and you know you're gonna be late. Or maybe you're a service sector minimum wage worker or, worker, or um, uh, as Mayor Tuck so eloquently put, just making above minimum wage. And um, you have a job that requires you, now nobody punches the clock anymore, but um, to be there on time. You get maybe once, maybe two strikes before your employer says, thanks a lot, son, thanks a lot, miss, but we're gonna look elsewhere, because you're depending on transit. So I, I just wanted to put that um, as by way of background. We have a lot of people use transit today whose household level and income is below the defined federal poverty threshold. Um, we have a lot of service sector uh, employees, people who we want to be there because they work in hotels or restaurants. Maybe they're working that CAT, CAT scan machine that your doctor ordered a test for you because they detected something. Maybe they're an orderly in the hospital that if you're in a medical complex or medical office and you want that room to be ready for you. Uh, they use transit to get to work. Uh, and we know that by our origin and destination survey. And they're basically hourly wage work workers. Um, that's a little bit of a background. So that's where we've been. Uh, we, we have a very unusual way that we fund transit in this region. We're a regional transit authority, as the you know, HRT, Hampton Roads Transit, serving six cities. Yet we have this peculiar cost allocation agreement that basically says, you know, I've told the story before. We don't sit on a big pile of cash and like a king or queen decide, you get this and you get that. Every year we go on an annual process to fund transit to each of our six member cities and literally contract with them to deliver what they're willing 
and what they can afford because they have many pressures of their own in their annual budgeting process where another line item in their budget where a non-departmental line item in their budget so city of norfolk uh, after you the allocation of federal and state operating assistance and whatever the fare box generates you determine that you'd like to fund upwards of 21 million dollars a year to support light rail to support ferry and the buses in your system four routes run 15 minute service frequencies a lot of service 30 minutes a day some other cities that have a different kind of characteristic than the city of Norfolk fund less service. Maybe it doesn't run till two in the morning like it does in Norfolk. Maybe it only runs till 7 p.m. or 6.30. Maybe it has a sparsity of service on the weekends. That's their choice and they have a lot of financial pressure. So we have this peculiar arrangement when the two agencies, uh, Tidewater Regional Transit and Municipal Transit merged in 1999 about how service is funded. No one city can impose upon any other city any cost or burden without the tacit approval of that other city. Buses don't recognize, uh, bus routes don't recognize city boundary lines. They, they, they don't know I'm running a military highway, the Route 15, that I'm actually going through three cities, Chesapeake, Virginia Beach, and Norfolk. They just know they're serving people that need to get somewhere along that route. However, some cities may offend that service that doesn't end that way. So the game changer, we can go to the next slide, is something through the generosity and the hard work of people like yourselves on this table, because many of you are up in Richmond, was that the General Assembly in 2020 allocated a source of funding through a variety of combination of assessments, dedicated funding that cuts across that entire barrier. No more do we have to go to each city and ask politely, sometimes beg, would you consider funding an extra hour service so we can get a later evening service, maybe more weekend service? This money is, uh, and it's been branded the 757 Express, the regional backbone service. This money is used to deliver one essential item. No matter where you are as a citizen of these six cities that we serve, no matter where you live, no matter where you work, two guarantees. 15 minute high frequency service, and your span of service is gonna be the same no matter what city you're in. So if you're a second or third shift worker in Chesapeake and you want to use public transit and you happen to work at Norfolk, uh, the, North, the Eastern Virginia Medical Center complex, mm -hmm. um, you don't have to worry about getting home because Chesapeake doesn't fund service after seven o'clock at night. You'll be able to get home because it's all gonna be running to one in the morning. It all starts at five in the morning, seven days a week. That is what this money is going to be used for. So let's go to the next slide. Um, in addition to service, which of course is the backbone, in order to deliver that service, you have to buy more equipment. We have a fleet today of approximately uh, just short of 300 uh, vehicles. That's our rolling stock, revenue vehicles. We're purchasing an another 48 vehicles to deliver that 15 minute service frequency. Um, a lot of facilities are gonna be needed to support the additional investment in rolling stock, where you house them, where you take care of them, where you maintain them. Um, an investment in human resources. You buy all this rolling stock, you provide all this 15 minute service, you're gonna need more bus operators, you're gonna need more mechanics. And that's a real challenge in today's environment because uh, no one wants to be a bus driver anymore. It's a really difficult job. And um, we found during the pandemic, the balance of uh, work life and the quality of life an operator has, we're juggling, uh, Families, children in school, there's lots of working moms and dads that have children in school. When you have to work an eight hour shift, uh, sometimes your service day as an operator split into two distinct portions. You drive a route in the morning, you have a middle of the day, and then you complete your route. Well, that actually turns out to be an 11 or 12 hour shift. And our operators tell us more than anything, uh, I can't make what I do every day with my family life mesh with your requirements under the contract you have with the bus operators. So that's a real big challenge. Plus holders of commercial driver's license, which you have to be to drive a bus, uh, it's a very hot commodity and very competitive in the private sector. You can pay much more than the public sector. Uh, and, and then couple on top of that, uh, changing laws in this country about uh, marijuana, you have to have a clean driving record. Uh, and you have to be physically fit. US DOT requires certain physical tests related to your weight, related to sleep apnea, and related to other conditions in order to drive a bus. And then top, put on top of that, how we as human beings 
we're an angry bunch sometimes, and uh, we have a lot in our mind when we're waiting for the bus. And like most human beings, the first person that we see is the first person we take it out on. So bus operators are undervalued and underappreciated at times, and they often get snapped at as the person boards the bus. Right, I should say it is a Transit Operator Appreciation Week here, and so if anybody sees a transit operator, you should say thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. So the other, uh, the other elements of the uh, RTS program in addition to service include technology investments, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and then communications and marketing, getting out there and letting folks know how this is not your mother's transit property, your father's transit property, is something radically different. So we can go to the next slide. Th this map, and there's several maps also that Bob and his team have provided, depicts um, in color a little bit the 13 regional backbone routes and the underlying maps and peninsula commuter services, the commuter express routes. Essentially, if you look at them and, you, and, in, and if you know your geographic area, they connect the essential uh, employment corridors in all of our six cities and they work together in tandem with the underlying commuter express services, providing high frequency service seven days a week to practically almost every job center in, in the cities. Um, the population serves from today to the future, we'll see a 169% increase in the amount of population that has access to high frequency service uh, with a 180% increase in average walking distance to a nearby bus stop. Uh, total system projected ridership is going to increase on an average weekday from 35,000 to 54,000 according to our projections. Let's go to the next slide, please. I know I should be advancing. So it starts with branding. Uh, we are already started branding. You may have seen some of our buses with the new branding. The Regional Transit System Program or the Hampton Roads Regional Transportation Program or the fund that provides the funding, we branded it 757 Express. Uh, even the Max routes now carry that brand and you'll see more and more buses. Our bus stop signs have that brand as a QR code, tells you exactly uh, where, what the route is, what the service band is and what the frequency is. Next slide. So service implementation, I thought it'd be important to talk about what we've done so far. We've ordered, ordered 24 of the new buses and they're on, they are on property now and another 12 are due to arrive uh, by August or September of this year. That's a heavy capital investment because the average price of a bus fully loaded now with fare box, CAD ADL, um, pat, automatic passenger counter, security cameras is $723, $723,000 per vehicle. Um, the first high frequency service was implemented in October of 2022 on the Route 112, which is the busiest route on the peninsula along Jefferson Avenue, which is the largest uh, transportation corridor that serves many, many jobs. Coming this May, we're going to hit our second high frequency route with the Route 114 on Mercury Boulevard in the city of Hampton, which is a, a natural connection to the 112, the east-west movement to the north-south loop. Then later this year in October, the busiest route in the Commonwealth of Virginia, let that sink in for a minute. We have the busiest route in the entire Commonwealth, even in Northern Virginia, the Route 20 on Virginia Beach Boulevard, carrying nearly 5,000 people on average weekday, back and forth from downtown Norfolk to the employment center of the oceanfront. That will see its high frequency 15 minute service all the way to the Virginia Beach oceanfront. Um, the routes 45 and 47, two essential routes that connect downtown Norfolk to uh, Portsmouth, uh, they will uh, be implemented in May of 2024 as we get the additional buses to come in and the additional riders. That leaves eight other routes that will, we believe will follow in quick succession as we continue to hire the bus operators. We would have been able to roll out more in this calendar year. The, the one defining moment for us is continuing to work as hard as we can to get and train qualified bus operators. That is the biggest challenge that not only this agency faces, but the entire country right now. That's the only limiting factor. Next slide, please. So I've talked about the new buses, so we can skip this. Technology. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to a customer that has been somewhere else in this country, and not too far sometimes, and they come back and hold up their cell phone in my face and say, why can't we have this? Well, RTS finally has given us the financial resources to invest in Go Mobile, which will provide two things at your fingertips real-time bus information on next bus arrival, or any information as to why it may be late, as well as the ability to first time to place that cell phone 
on the fare box and have it scan and you have a cashless transaction. This is a game changer and we're gonna to start to roll that out this October, this fall, I should say. And Commissioner, you know that well. Um, we're really excited about this because our customers expect it um, and it's such a natural for our users of the system because as we get to higher frequency service, they don't have to be looking at their watch and watching the time closely because of hourly service. And they can just look at their phone now and know that in five minutes I should leave to catch a bus. And you don't have to carry cash in your pocket to fumble around your pocket for that exact change. There will always be a segment of our population that uses transit that will need, you know, we call them the unbanked. Uh, maybe they don't have an account that's linked to your debit account. But this is a real game changer for a lot of riders and something we've heard big time from our customers. Uh, in addition to this, in addition to this, every major transit center, um, Hampton Transit Center, Newport News Transit Center, downtown Norfolk Transit Center, these are the big three, and as we build more, we'll have real-time passenger information displays, just like in an airport. So if you're waiting inside the building and it's raining outside, you don't want to wait outside in the rain or the wind or the snow. You can stay in that building and it'll tell you when the bus is arriving and in the designated slot and when it's due to depart. It will also have on those passenger information displays a reason for any delay or any, any announcement related to weather events. This is another big game changer for us and again made available because of the money the General Assembly approved. Now here's one that's near and dear to my heart, um, having come from New York City. Uh, the first time I started riding the system when I got here in 97, I was appalled at the undignified way customers had to wait for transit at a so-called bus stop. I've seen passengers, moms with kids in their hands, sitting in a, standing in a swale that had water in it with no sidewalk, no curb and gutter. I've seen people sitting on the ground after rain, the grass is wet, overturned shopping carts unsheltered bus stops. We have over 2,700 bus stops throughout the six cities. And, and when I arrived, only 100 of them had shelters. Again, it was a function of how capital improvements could be scheduled since we depend on discretionary grants up until the General Assembly money for any capital investment in this region. Uh, we do not get capital dollars from um, any of the six cities. We get operating assistance. Um, they provide a small amount of money to fund any discretionary grants that we go after. This is a game changer. We think in the first round of improving amenities and the, and the uh, waiting arrangement for our passengers, we can do over 620 bus stops with shelters that provide protection from the weather, lighting, benches, a waste receptacle, information kiosk, a path for ADA access accessibility to be inside the shelter, as well as access to bus with ADA accessible curbs. I put up uh, on this table in a quick snapshot since January a picture of the pre-RTS 261 shelters. Since we've started last year, we've added another 142 shelters, but we have a long way to go. Uh, shelters, thank you for highlighting that. Shelters are, is, is tough. They're in the public right-of-way. HRT doesn't control the public right-of-way. Each of the six cities do. So we literally have to get a permit issued through each of the city's public works department for the installation of each shelter. Sometimes you might be encroaching on property not even the cities have, so we have what we call skinny shelters. This happens to be a fat shelter here. We have three types of shelters. <laughs> but uh, we have to do what we can do. But our goal is one day, since I cross my fingers this funding should remain in perpetuity, we will have all 2,700 bus stops sheltered, which is, which is really the way to treat your customer. Oftentimes, oftentimes I, I, I tell people, you know, to our operators especially, the first touch of transit for a customer is the face they see behind the steering wheel. It's not. The first touch of transit is waiting for the bus. What is the experience that customer is experiencing? Will they come back again if they have to sit in the wet ground or if they have to sit in an overturned shopping cart or if they don't have any protection for the weather elements? I think of all the elements, I'm about to talk about something that's really big and really sexy. I think this is the unsung hero of the entire program is passenger amenities. Um, next slide, please. Okay, here, here's the big sexy thing, the new Southside Bus Operating Division. And uh, all kidding aside, um, 
We only have two bus operating maintenance divisions in the entire six city footprint. One is up in the city of Hampton on Victoria Boulevard. That's actually dates back to the old trolley facility from the turn of the last century. And the other is our 18th, facility, 18th Street facility in Norfolk that also dates back to streetcar times. We have a big geographic footprint. Uh, the eastern portion and the southern portion of our service district on the south side, we have to run deadhead buses. I have never seen such an inefficient operation. From downtown Norfolk, nearly 20 miles to get on route for some of those Virginia Beach routes or to get on route for some of the Chesapeake routes to start revenue service. Highly inefficient, but that's pretty much what we're relegated to from the legacy of what these two agencies that merged in 1990 were. We have out of Parks Avenue in Virginia Beach, a very small on 0.8 acres, old 35, 40 year old facility that was intended for seasonal trolley services. It is so old that the modern buses can't even fit in it. The lifts, when they lift the bus up, the bus hits the ceiling, so you have to keep it lower to repair it. Basically, it's a non-functioning obsolete facility. So for the first time, this is gonna provide the capital money to build a new Southside bus operating maintenance division at state of the art on the Eastern portion of our service district. And if we go to the next slide, I can show you a map. And you can see there's 18th Street in downtown Norfolk, um, on the South side anyway, and there's the old trolley uh, uh, division in Parks Avenue. Approximately at uh, General Booth Boulevard and Corporate Landing in uh, Corporate Landing uh, Park of Virginia Beach, we're gonna acquire with the good graces of the city of Virginia Beach, a 12 acre site to build a facility that'll be able to accommodate 100 buses plus the 16 trolley vehicles. And let's go to the next slide. What's really unique about this facility and is proactive, it'll be the first zero emission transit facility in the US that we believe of this size. Why is that important? Two reasons. The feds have set a mandate that there won't be any sales of diesel buses after uh, 2035 and the state has a, a similar law that there will no longer be sales of diesel buses by 2031, I think. Every agency is being asked to develop trans, um, transition plans from an all electric diesel, from an all diesel fleet to an all electric fleet or some other uh, alternative fuel vehicle. So this is a proactive opportunity because this is a 35 to 50 year investment for us to start and in the right footing. And um, this is a rendering, you can see all the solar panels that will allow us to raise a pentagraph or lower a pentagraph onto the bus to charge each of the vehicles. This will be much more efficient than the plugins that we have for the six Proterra buses. Next slide, please. So here's one of the six Proterra buses that we're using as a test of electric vehicles to understand better what battery electric buses can do. They're housed at 18th Street today. We've been deploying them on long routes, short routes, routes that have some elevation. There's not much elevation in Hampton Roads uh, and some other challenges. We're learning a lot from these six pilot vehicles that we uh, bought uh, from Proterra. Uh, first of all, like all sales people, what they tell you and what is delivered never comes out. We thought we were going to get uh, 200 hours of charge time on the bus and we're really getting close to about 125. When you're in the heat or when you're in the really cold weathers, uh, the battery uh, drains quicker. When you have large passenger loads or any kind of grade change, the battery drains quicker. Uh, if you forget to plug the bus in when you're in the shop at night, that bus is not gonna be charged in the morning. Uh, that's why we're looking at pentagraph charging as smart technology that detects the bus coming into the garage, talks to the bus literally through the electronics, understands how much charge the battery needs and then moves the bus along after its charge is, is reached so the next bus can be charged. But we're learning a lot from the six electric buses. Next slide. So we actually have, because it's required, a fleet transition plan uh, in terms of how do we um, get this fleet from all diesel to, uh, to, with the exception of six, to all electric. And it's not an easy task. Um, the new facility, we can deliver it in one shot, assuming we have enough money to do that. We are seeking discretionary money for the new facility uh, in a variety of low, no, low, low to no emissions bus grants, bus and bus facility grant, raise grants and Department of Energy grants, we're applying for all of them to supplement the General Assembly money. 18th Street, right now, working in partnership with Dominion Energy, has only the capacity to provide enough energy to uh, 
to supply to those six charging stations. 18th Street is an old facility that will need an upgrade from Dominion Energy as we continue to bring more electric buses on. The Hampton facility has even less infrastructure uh, by Dominion Energy and will require a big uh, electrical supply upgrade for Hampton facility. But we do have a plan and even longer term, we're looking at on the peninsula, a satellite facility to, for the northern end of the peninsula up in the Denby area that we don't have so many deadhead miles where everything deploys out to the southern end of the peninsula. So we did put an electrification plan, transition plan together and are submitting that to FDA and to the state as required. And then finally, one more slide. The project benefits of going all electric, I have a picture here. Um, I must remember the numbers. Just, just on operating cost savings for the Virginia Beach Division, we see a reduction in deadhead miles of anywhere between 62,000 and 91,000 deadhead miles a year. Think about that, that's empty buses just getting to point because they're way out in Norfolk at 18th Street to Virginia Beach or maybe to Greenbrier Mall with no passengers, but they're using fuel, the tires are losing tread wear, the engine and lubricants are being worn out. We'll see at least a, nearly a half a million dollars in savings every year. Of course, that leads to reduced fossil fuel use, 300,000 pounds of greenhouse gases removed each year as we begin the transition with an efficient building design and 125 new jobs created uh, and 300,000 jobs that will be reached by bus in this new facility. That was a really quick whirl around to 757 Express. It's a really exciting program. Um, HRT is, has its blemishes. We are not perfect, but we have six wonderful partners the dialogue is, it has continued and improved every year. The Hampton Road Regional Transportation Planning Organization. I've always felt uh, it's really easy to love single occupant vehicles. If you're a baseball fan, everybody loves a winner. So everybody loves New York Yankees when I was in, when I was in New York. You couldn't find a New York Mets fan, the lovable losers, you know, the lovable mutts they used to call them. But, or transit, transit's like that, or maybe we're like Cinderella. Everybody else got to go to the ball we were still left at the fireplace waiting to go to the ball. So, or maybe we're Rodney Dangerfield. We get no respect. But I really think the General Assembly gave us that respect. And every one of you that went up there and advocated for transit, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Because truly, transit has a, transit has a place in everything we talked about today. And I really mean that. Thank you. Th thank you, Ray. And um, you know, I think as Ray describes I said, first off, Ray, I'm a Pittsburgh Pirates fan. So I understand <laughs> lovable losers. Uh, begin with that. I heard that Jeff Roleski while laughing in the back. Uh, um, but really what an exciting moment we are at with transit and um, Trinita why don't you sort of uh, take us home with uh, no pun intended there with uh, a few closing comments in terms of uh, opportunities if we can go back Dimitri to that to our initial PowerPoint there. Trinita just has a couple final uh, comments to make and then we want to see what conversation we can I do have a comment, uh, Bob and Shanita. So that whole program that Ray just went over is does actually have a tie to housing. So what is it funded by? The grant tourist tax, a new one, and a $20 million contribution from each locality, and tourism, the transit occupancy tax. So there is a good tie there um, and nexus for what we're going over to. And, and Brian, I, I, you know, I just start thinking about opportunities, and I know your city is deliberating what the Williams track might look like, right? And you know, obviously if that's going to be an opportunity for job creation, being able to engage HRT and different choices for transportation is, is another exciting opportunity. Maybe some of the considerations we can begin to think about. So Shunita? Yeah, wanna... so we really, really wanted to tie this all in, like why are we here? So we, we've heard a lot of what the problems that we see out um, as it relates to housing, what we know, what we don't know. So what we have been on the, what, what the last couple of months we have been doing is just trying to have more of these intentional conversations to make sure that we're hearing um, information from other specialties and other disciplines as it relates to housing and transportation, housing and health, housing and education. So we're, we're trying to figure out who the players are, where does the housing, issues that we see intersect other disciplines as we discuss. 
What we are looking at is a true housing assessment, a true regional housing assessment, the first of its kind in our area. We've done sub-regional work. We've done um, Hampton and Newport News. We've done Southside. We've done Peninsula. We've done Rural. But we have never really looked at housing from the spotlight of looking at it from a, a regional standpoint of, of Hampton Roads. We know we need to assess the programs that we already have. How do we categorize those? Uh, we know there are programs in each city. They're different. If you were to ask me about home ownership opportunities in James City County, it looks different from home ownership opportunities in Williamsburg. So if I was to land at Norfolk Airport new to this region and I needed to access housing, where would I go? Who would I talk to? How would I decide where I wanted to live? If I needed down payment assistance, who's out there? If I wanted someone to assist me with finding rent, if I was a tenant and I have been discriminated on, how do I find that, that, advocate, that advocate group? So we want to do a true assessment of the programs and services that we have, a true gap of what's missing, what we could need, what could be different, and um, really understand how that plays into the type of housing stock we have. If we're building, as Mayor, Mayor Tuck alluded, uh, houses that require two to three parking spots, and we know that the, the trend is a scooter and public transportation, have we ruined an opportunity to build in those neighborhoods? So really looking at that and looking at best practices. We, we've thrown out a couple of things. Um, I'm talking to Mr. Sellis about land trust, looking at other groups and organizations in the state with other innovative ideas. Uh, Mayor Glover talked about uh, his new, uh, I'm not going to say new, but looking at how employees or cities can have things as it relates to uh, down payment uh, closing costs for their employees. You know, is that a, a, a pro possible viable option? So we're, as we do this housing assessment, we want to prioritize what's in the region. What we have seen is every time we say affordable housing or a housing plan that each locality has to agree on every aspect. What we see is having something that is a la carte for you to build on the strengths and of your localities, of your areas, and also improve other areas that we know that we need to do. So we know that a true housing assessment from, we don't know, a third party or someone to come in, uh, listen to what we, we know the needs are. We're very different. We have transit issues. We have waterways, we have environmental issues that we have to look at. How do we build the best model for that? So who should lead this charge? This is some of the questions we have been asking internally. Who should be involved? We knew that we had to have transit around this table. And, and start thinking if there are other people that you don't see around this table that we need to have included in these conversations as we're doing this general work. And how do we fund? Of course, no one wants to talk about the funding piece sometimes, but how do we fund a plan that is livable? You know, and we all have seen the plans that you, you do when you put them on your shelf, but how do we um, create a livable plan that when you are looking to create something in your locality, the work is there, the best practices are there, the toolkits are in place that we can kind of do that. So these are some of the questions we wanted to talk with you all about as we look at some of the other linkages that we have put together between housing and transit. And we're gonna kind of leave it there for the discussion. I've listed a few um, of those linkage pieces that we have seen that could be incorporated as it relates to transit. When you're looking at a housing and transportation affordability index, um, and that's an index that you're looking at the housing costs as well as the transportation costs when you're looking at affordability. And there's a website that will give you uh, snapshots. There's a couple of different websites. But for instance, this one gave um, a South, I did a South Side um, report as it relates to somewhere in Northern Virginia. So when you're looking at walkability, it gave a 9% walkability in our area and 99% in Arlington based on transit. It looks at environmental issues. It looks at green gas emissions. Uh, how do we build more walkable um, housing indexes? And it looked at both at the same time. So drive until you qualify. Greg and I were talking about, do people really understand what drive and qualify? Um, we see it every day when we're looking at um, first-time home buyers that um, 
typically may tell us we'll live in Suffolk, we'll live in Franklin, we'll commute to Virginia Beach. Or we have a firefighter in Chesapeake that says, I have to live in Moyoc because it's more affordable. So how do we uh, typically, clients will typically go out as far as they can for affordability, but what happens with that? The transportation costs is increased, the gas costs is increased. You're running back and forth to get your children back in school in that jurisdiction, but you're working somewhere else. So um, transit-oriented development, that was one of the key principles that you all had recommended in your work group. How do we look at transportation, housing, and mobility? In terms of mobility, this is how do you move people to better opportunities? How do you incentivize uh, people that want to live and work in, in, in areas? And how do you build trust and build a community around that person? It's nothing to move someone um, out of downtown Portsmouth and move them to another area if their core group, their family, their culture, their church, their sense of being is somewhere else. How do you create a sense of being wherever we relocate our clients? And looking more at the, the correlation between employment, housing, and transit. How do we start tying those three as we look? So I wanted to provide just some key suggestions of some things that we have seen in other areas that have worked. Some um, times they are built upon each other. Sometimes you need them all. But we just wanted to open to a discussion about what you see that connection should be and how do we move forward in that part? Thank you, Shernita. And I think that, you know, as we think about some of the corridors Ray was talking about, just Virginia Beach Boulevard, right? Thinking about underutilized properties, potential redevelopment opportunities, mixed use opportunities, uh, and some of the other corridors that you saw in the regional transit backbones, it, it does present an exciting opportunity for us. So why don't we just pause and see what questions, conversation that there might be. Yes, Angie? Not me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so thinking about this and listening to the discussion, one of the things I see, because we keep coming back to the localities being um, the drivers of routes and, um, and uh, understanding best their own um, needs and desires is, and maybe they maybe they already do it, but um, kind of doubling down in their capital improvement plans, their, you know, their development plans of the localities. Uh, Mayor Tuck, maybe that's um, something you can comment on about, about actually being very intentional about where you currently could create that synergy with transit, and in future, you know, you've set up this business park. You've set, up, you know, how could that all be um, connected? Could it? Could the rights of way that are being used also uh, be lit by um, uh, the fibering? The, you know, how can you connect all the things that the localities are doing? And that starts with the planning. And so maybe that is a, a good place to, to start um, the, the base level. Um, and we talked about it, you know, a lot of, of the other things that, that go with this and, and the you know, misconceptions or um, misunderstandings about what affordable housing is and how this might, might play into that. The shelters that you want to build, Ray, I mean, We've been talking about that for years. Uh, in 2012, through Story, uh, a business partner of mine uh, and I actually walked from my house on Shore Drive almost a mile to a stick in the ground that was the bus stop. We transferred. We got on light rail, another bus, and then walked to go meet Mr. Smith. And it almost was three hours. <laughs> and so, I mean, they've come a, they've come a long way, but there's a lot, a lot more we can do. There's lots of room for improvement for every locality that's a part of this. 
Any other, Ms. McClellan? Uh, number one, um, timely, uh, Norfolk has a city council meeting that starts a work session at 3.30 today, and we're having an entire discussion on affordable housing. So if you go to norfolk.gov, you'll be able to see the presentation and download that and take a look at it tomorrow. Uh, number two, I think every elected official at the local and the state level, federal level too, should be required to ride our transit service. I think um, all of us should be on those buses, understanding what it's, you know, going to that stick in the road that Angie mentioned. Um, and we did do that when we were up at uh, Transit Advocacy Day this past year in the General Assembly, invited some of the delegates and the senators. But I think we can do a better job of encouraging um, having the experience really as eye-opening. So I would suggest that. So Alexis and I would like to talk with you just a little about that, but first I want to be certain there um, aren't any other questions. Yes, um, not every locality in the PDC is a part of the TPO. Um, and so with that becomes a lot of, I guess, things that may not be seen as being fair across the board to some of those localities that are not within the TPO. Um, some of those, I guess, transportation studies, um, one of the localities I used to work for, um, they were a member of, 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 a, of a TPO, and what, what that brought, of course, is um, being able to be a part of those transportation studies. The locality that I'm in right now, Missouri, um, we were competing statewide with some projects at the smart scale level. Um, one of those projects, um, uh, because of the size of our right-of-ways, um, was the study was, um, it, it didn't work out well. This, the estimates came in pretty low when the, when the state came in, did another study, they found out the cost of it was twice twice the amount, so we lost the whole smart scale project. Um, and so what that brings up now, we you know, these localities that are, that are not within the CPO, how do we compete to bring out these connections um, for people having a uh, connection to their homes and jobs, um, at some point, some level, someone's going to have to say, "Hey, these other localities over here, they they need they need your they need our help. We need some type of regional cooperation to help us out because there there's people that actually want to live in those localities. Um, you know, we may not be the first choice for some people, but for some people, they are. Um, we do have places where people want to be employed." Um, Local uh, businesses do want to move out to uh, some of some of those localities, um, and obviously there are people that do want to uh, move to our localities as well. Obviously, cost of housing and land is cheaper in some of those small localities. So those are some of the things that we want to keep in, in mind too. Some of the small localities, uh, we're thankful for being at the table, when because we, typically when it comes to transportation, we're not at the, at the table to talk about it. But just want to keep that in, in mind. And it's an excellent point, of course, to be in the transportation planning organization by federal regulation. You have to be in the urbanized area or projected to be urbanized, and maybe Missouri is not. However, I, I do think there is opportunity through the rural planning program and maybe us sitting down with you all in uh, Tri-Cities, the PDO, and um, PD, Crater PDC to talk about what those opportunities might be. I think you raise an excellent point because when you start thinking about the Port 460 economic development project, and there's going to be a lot of people looking for <laughs> uh, places to live, and I think some of those options will be in your area. So I think you raise some, some excellent, excellent points. And it was like Shernita was saying about just those, you know, the, the, the rural issues are there as well, right, in terms of supply, in terms of affordability and the amenities. So. Thank, thank you for making those comments. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Bob. And I just want to make a statement with it. Um, Shernita, Bob, everyone here in the room, you know, it's it's really good to know that we want to work together as a region to solve some of these pressing issues. As you all know, in the city of Portsmouth, uh, we deal with a number of these affordable housing issues. And I'm just looking forward to the continued dialogue sharing of information and ideas but I think one thing I know that will come out of this if we utilize some of the things that we, that I've heard at this meeting today and continue to move forward with setting goals and achieving some things uh, we will work towards improving quality and affordability housing so I'm excited thank you mayor
Yes, please. Um, from the um, resort area, I know one of the things we talked about early on was trying to get the workforce down there. Um, they looked at having buses that would run from the folks down. Um, the other piece is um, the J1 workers and finding housing for them when they're not necessarily housing for people who live here year round, but just to keep that in mind that there's ways to house them near transit and ways they can get to their work jobs. That would be great. I wanted to um, just touch quickly on some um, next steps for, for both groups. Um, so first, let's um, let's 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 talk about sort of the, the path forward for the housing work group. Uh, what we heard from our housing work group at the first meeting was we wanted to have this transit conversation, but we also had to bring the private sector uh, into the conversation. Shernita has. Uh, worked on that. We we have a private sector representative uh, willing to meet with our housing work group. Uh, we're probably going to uh, pivot pretty quickly here coming out of this meeting and be sending you all for the housing committee some potential dates with our next uh, housing work group meeting focus. I think you need on that private sector conversation, right? I think that um, we heard that we really needed to talk to developers. Um, so we have done that um, initial work and have probably a location and two speakers that can talk to us from the development's perspective about the creation of housing from that. that way. So that will be the, the track that we're going to be on. We're going to be, uh, with the housing group, we're going to be capturing the notes from today. Uh, we'll be uh, follow up with you on some of the ideas shared today. Now the second track is for the RTAP. Um, so, I wanted to, um, you can expect us to be calling an RTAP meeting for April, and um, this will be why. So, we have been coordinating, Alexis, thank you for all your work, and, and with HRT staff. Uh, you'll recall a year ago, February, RTAP went to the General Assembly for our first Regional Transit Advocacy Day at the General Assembly. Um, we've heard two things from everyone on the RTAP. Um, number one, let's do a meeting on the buses, right? And number two, let's let's be straightforward and honest, and we've talked about it today. We have some advocacy to do for transit in our own region, right? So in cooperation with uh, HRT, what we are proposing is a regional transit advocacy day. Um, I'd like to ask everybody to hold May the 4th on your calendar. I uh, am... And Alexis, would you mind just giving a real quick overview, if you could quickly, um, of, of what we envision that day being? And um, I know everybody's anxious to, but I just want to give you a, a little bit of a background, uh, Alexis, if, if you could, please. Thanks so much. Sure. Um, so really quickly, because um, I know everyone is, is ready to head out. Um, so Transit Advocacy Day, as Bob alluded to, um, is scheduled for Thursday, May 4th. Um, we will meet at 1130 and the activities will conclude around four o'clock. The purpose really is for us to come together and discuss and really advocate on the importance of transit from a community and economy perspective, and also just to push and reiterate the need for additional funding. We have a lot going on with the 757 Express, but um, additional funding is needed because there's lots more to do. Um, what that day will look like, um, we will meet at our Norfolk Tide facility um, behind Norfolk State University at 11.30 for lunch. Um, about an hour in, we will walk over uh, to the westbound um, light rail stop and board the train, take that train into downtown. We will debark the train um, at the Monticello station and we will transfer to a bus and we will take that bus into the HRT facility located at 18th Street. From there, we will uh, debrief shortly, just discuss some of our observations, answer any questions, and then we will um, open up for a media event. Um, we're hoping to get some really key um, keynote speakers at the event to kind of really draw the media in and to really push this message um, out. And so we are hoping that that will conclude around four o'clock. 
Um, what we'll need from you is, although this is Trans Advocacy Day, on one day we plan to make it Trans Advocacy Week, um, and that will be a really strong digital push um, with a strong presence on social media. So we will need for you all to engage in our social media posts, so retweeting, reposting, commenting, liking, all those things. And then also, um, you know, posting curated message on, messages on your own uh, pages so uh, your constituents can see them. Um, and then we will provide at the next meeting some tri-transit passes. We're just asking that you distribute those to friends and family. Um, we're hoping that we can create new advocates for uh, transit. And then we will just possibly uh, increase ridership. Um, or at the very least, familiarity with our system. A lot of people say that they are hesitant to try HRT because they're not familiar with it. They don't know what to do. They don't know where to go. Um, so this kind of pushes them to um, experience our services firsthand. So um, everyone here is invited. We would love to have you all join us on this day and let us know if you have any questions. Thank you, Alexis. So for now, if you could please place a hold if you're available on May the 4th. Um, Matt uh, lets me know that this is Star Wars Day. Uh, May the 4th be with you, so that's how I'm remembering it. Um, <laughs> so we're making transit cool again, guys. <laughs> yeah, Shanita said we'll all dress like uh, stormtroopers, right? <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> but um, what we would like to do is hold a RTAP meeting in April where, Alexis, we can ask you for the help that we're going to need. Number one, we'd like the RTAP membership to be a part of that day, so we're going to need to get good uh, counts. Um, and, and then Ms. McClellan, Mayor Tuck, and others, you know, we're really hoping that we can bring key elected officials to that media event that will conclude in each of our T offices, so at, at the conclusion of that day. And um, Alexis, we could send this out to everybody maybe so everybody has that. Absolutely. A save the date um, will be forthcoming so that you all will have at least some of the details and you can save the date on your calendars. Great. Um, thank you very much. And we'll be uh, making invitations to general assembly members, to our federal delegation, et cetera. Okay. And uh, Matt uh, will be working with the HRT uh, public relations people uh, to really make certain we can get a strong media turnout as well when we finally HRT offices. Okay. Well, thank you. I know that was a, a, a bit a full two hours. Um, any closing comments? Uh, understanding you'll be hearing us from the housing committee about that meeting as, as we bring in a developer and RTAP will be pulling you together in April to get ready for our advocacy day on May the 4th. Sound like a plan? Yeah. Hey, All quickly right. here, Bob. Um, quickly. Who, who would Oh, and yesterday we 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 launched some, something called TREC, which is Transit uh, Resilience Essential Community. It's all about getting getting our, our, our underserved community workers uh, to uh, work centers doing doing climate emergencies like flooding, hurricanes going in, etc. When, when, when transit go go through per, perturbations and such, so it's called Transit the Resilience Essential Community. We we, we uh, work work with uh, two single group corporations. I, I, out of New York, along with Data Clinic and such, so it's available online. I'll make sure that Barry gets it. Thank, thank you, Gary. All right, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate your participation today.